Scottish football still hangs in the balance, torn between the passion of the fans and commercial pressures. Unsure which way to turn, lacking in confidence. Maybe right now we're a wee bit short of that in the football world. If you looked at the cold, harsh reality of the quality fare that's been served up, I think you would go and jump in the Clyde. Success lies in the past. As experts are always quick to point out. There was a time if the Scottish squad walked down Piccadilly Circus, everyone would have known who they were. If this current Scottish squad walked down Sockey Hall Street, I'm not sure most of them would be instantly recognisable. But one thing is clear. We need to change. We need to do things differently. It's a minnow in terms of competitive capacity. Blueprints, reports, commissions set up. You don't need a blueprint. Go to Georgia and beat them. The same questions have been raised over and over again. Maybe it's time for some new ones. And to face up to the possibility that, for Scotland, the game may well be up. The fans are the life's blood of the game, and the sooner that the people in football realise this, the better it will be for each and individual club. Jock Steen one of the greatest football managers of all time, understood what the game meant to supporters. His comments, made 50 years ago, are just as relevant today. Football without fans is nothing. It can be the greatest game in the world. If there are no people there to watch it, it becomes nothing. Fans support their teams from cradle to grave, often unquestioningly, but with an intense devotion. I think with football, there's a, a kind of risk-benefit equation in that emotionally you have to invest in it to get something out of it. Um, and so people can become too emotionally invested in it. But at the same time, if you don't invest in it emotionally, you don't feel anything when your team wins, you don't feel anything when your team loses. The thing about a fan, I suppose, is that if I'm a fan, I don't necessarily change my team. There's a way in which, over the years, I think Scottish football probably has exploited that. They have taken them, to some extent, for granted. But they also realise that the fan has an intensity and an emotional engagement, which you can transfer financially into a financial engagement. But you need to understand that relationship with them. It's a relationship that relies on long-term loyalty, but the game is in decline. While committed fans will hang on, clubs often struggle to find new fans in the same numbers, with the same level of commitment. As money and media become more and more important to the game, Scottish football is struggling to find its place and draw a big enough audience in a globalised market, where there is already endless choice. Not so long ago, it was a much simpler world. Highlight of recent wartime sport was the International at Hampton Park. 133,000 people watched and certainly got their money's worth. The communities that provided those crowds have gone, but football still draws loyal fans. Scotland proportionately still has more people going to football matches week in, week out than any other nation in Europe. Whether it still means what it meant in the 1930s, the 1940s, I seriously doubt because society has changed, the workplace has changed, the patterns of kind of how we receive and gain entertainment has changed, and the loyalty that people felt to a single community, that they turn up every Saturday to support that community, has changed as well. Fans do still turn up to the big occasions, but the more mundane routine of Scottish club football has in many cases seen crowds decline. Just as the commercial pressures have increased. Football's always been a battleground. 
First of all, it's actually a business, but also it has a kind of a profile. So you have um, television, you have club owners who are in this very strange position where they rely on everybody because they play in a league, but they're also in intense rivalry with those people in the league. So, you know, there are kind of alliances that are put together, but actually they quite often fall apart very quickly. And then in addition to that, you have the fans who don't always speak with one voice. You have sponsors, you have a whole range of kind of uh, stakeholders, as I suppose, and we wouldn't have used that word in 1985, but that's, that would be how we would describe them now. And the, the problem quite often is, is that the agendas are often in conflict uh, um, in terms of trying to um, pull, pull those groups together. Gavel. Everyone agrees on one thing. When the game is good, it's truly beautiful. That's Lorimer. Oh, what a shot that was. Law and a goal. There's Kenny Douglas in there. Oh, what a goal. Oh, yes. Scotland had a constant supply of great players in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But with one or two exceptions, that era is long gone. Since the inception of the Champions League in 1993, over 400 players have been awarded winners' medals. Only two of them were Scots. Darren Fletcher for Manchester United and Paul Lambert with Borussia Dortmund. In 1996, Lambert attended trials in Germany where he was signed by the club. There he discovered just what made German teams so successful. It was that era where the Germans were really prominent in, in European football. Schalke had won the UEFA Cup, Germany had won the Euro 96. Dortmund were Champions League winners. So German football at that time was powerful. I was under no illusions how hard this was going to be. Coming from Scotland, you have to have a mindset of, you have to change. You have to adapt to the Germans, no, not them adapting to me, I had to adapt to them. It becomes a job. You very rarely get a day off. We're always training. I fell into a right good side. The Dortmund lads were, every one of them were, were excellent with me. So you've got, to, you've got to want to do it and you've got to have a bit of luck on your side to, to get it. The Dortmund team was full of established and rising stars, including experienced goalkeeper Stefan Kloss. So he was on the back of the bus and um, you could hear a pin drop. Stefan Claus said to me, how are you feeling? I went, I'm all right. He said, what about you? And I could see his leg kind of tapping, you know. I went, you all right? Sort of thing. He went, yeah, I'm all right. He said, but look at everybody else. And that was guys that won the World Cup and, and European Championships and Bundesliga titles and Serie A titles. And I was like, Oof. This is a lefty one, lefty one. One of the biggest names and most talented players in the history of football was on the opposing team that night, Zinedine. Lambert's dedication and fitness, honed by a punishing German training regime, paid dividends. Carl Rieder scored two great goals. Lars Ricken scored one of the best goals, I think, in the Champions League football with his first touch of the ball. As soon as that goal went in, I knew it was finished. And then after the game, it was just mayhem. Brilliant occasion, that. I mean, to win the Champions League is... Um, you don't realise how big that is until you actually win it. There's no two ways about it. You became super confident. You thought you were unbeatable. And, the, and that's what it taught you. And, and people say, what's the German title? Like that? That's exactly what it's like, right? We won. Anybody I, I played against after that, it didn't phase me one bit. He brought that confidence back to Scotland when he returned to play for Celtic helping them reach the 2003 UEFA Cup final in Seville, where they played Porto. 
70 odd thousand Celtic fans descended in Seville. Not all were able to get tickets for the game, but it was a sight to behold. You could have played in any stadium in the world that night, and I'll guarantee you that there'd have been 80% full of Celtic fans. Nothing can take away from the fact that we lost the game, we lost the match in extra time to a very, very poor goal, and, uh, and that was a massive disappointment. It was probably the biggest regret I've got in football. There's no one in that trophy that year. It would have been great to sit here with two winners, European medals. That's, that's a disappointment. They may have lost that match, but Paul Lambert had demonstrated the ability to play consistently at the highest level, a rare trait in the Scottish game. One man willing to embrace new techniques, who also came with a reputation for physical fitness, was former Scotland international John Collins. Collins had played in the French League for Monaco. I look back now and it was probably the best move in my life. Uh, not just in football, but in seeing things from a different perspective. From a football and a training point of view, it was the hardest two years of my career. Morning and afternoon, double sessions, regular training camps. It was seven days a week, strict diets, body fats. But when you want to get to the top and stay at the top, that's why they, they produce champions, they do it right, they train properly. In 2006, John Collins was appointed Hibs manager. His ambition was to bring the work rate of the players up to the level he had experienced in France. Early the next year, his team reached the League Cup final. In the weeks before the match, he was keen to push the players to an even higher level of fitness. Went to the board and says, look, can I get a training camp? For me, it was the perfect five days preparing, but some of the players weren't happy. They thought they were going on a stag night. They thought they wanted nights out, but Scottish training camp and a French training camp is worlds apart. Um, and there was only one way I was going to do it, and that was the way I did it as a player. The training camp was a huge success. What do you want from a training camp? No injuries. Come back, ready to go, and that's exactly what we got. No injuries. Came back for the cup final, and they put on the performance of their lives. I was proved it was the right way to do it. We played terrific. And Stephen Fletcher nets the fifth goal. Very rarely you win a, a cup final with five goals uh, and a terrific performance. So. It was a special moment, maybe, maybe the most special moment in my career, I've got to say, certainly. Hamden, Hibs fans singing the sunshine and leaf at the end of it. I'd lost my father a couple of months before, so it was a sad time, but I was on the park thinking he would have loved to have been there singing and hearing that. That would have been special for him, but for me that was, it was a great feeling. Despite that success, Collins found himself in the middle of a player rebellion. They had complained to the club chairman about the training regime. Talk of unrest in the Hibs dressing room persists tonight, despite manager John Collins' attempt to calm the waters. There was a few complaints. Um, they didn't get their own way. But uh, there's two ways of looking at it. Of course, you've got to try and keep players happy. But I think it's more important that players keep the coaching staff happy. But trust me, um, the way I did it was what I thought was right um, for them as individual players to make them better young players. He had taken the team to their first trophy for 16 years. But the damage was done. Collins departed Hibernian, saying he had achieved all he could. Thank you. 
For the game to survive at the top level, there needs to be a continual supply of good young players ready to move into the elite game. If that flow stops, then that failure will soon become apparent. It has now been almost two decades since Scotland have competed at a World Cup or European Championship. Even as far back as 1982, when the international team had qualified to play at the World Cup in Spain and the youth teams were winning at international level, the warnings were already there. Andy Roxburgh won the European Under-18 Championship. Andy did the 20 team in the quarter-final of the World Cup. I had a team in the final, final of the World Cup, under 16. So at that era, the end of the 80s, start of the 90s, we were as good as any country in the world at youth level. So what's gone wrong? Quite a number of things, I think. Andy Roxburgh, the director of football at the time and successful manager of Scotland international youth teams, had been studying the game closely. In the old days, we produced players almost you know, by chance. Um, because they would come out of this fantastic football environment that we had. Everybody was passionate about the game, everybody played in the streets, everybody played in our school teams, etc, etc. What's happened now is that that natural environment uh, has changed. It's had to become artificially, if you like, created. The question is chance or design. And I would say that the Scottish environment in the past was more about chance. The plant talents appeared, you know. But now it's got to be about design because they're no longer in the streets anymore. It's not going to happen the way it did in the past. Way back in 1982, uh, I worked with Andy Roxburgh. He asked me to read this report that he was doing, and in his report he stated that the standard of players coming in to the professional game in Scotland would, um, would drop, and that the numbers that were going to come into the professional game would drop as well. And it always stuck with me because I disagreed with it, but he was correct, and I was wrong. Grassroots youth coaches are the most important coaches in this country. Um, so we've got to get better on the training pitch. What are we doing? Are we doing enough working with the ball? And I don't mean one ball between 11 kids. I mean one ball, one kid to start with from a young age. You can have all the tactics in the world, but if you've not got the fundamental skills of top level players, then no coach in the world are going to win matches. Yeah. Gotta get back to it, ball mastery. That's, for me, that's the secret of developing world-class players. It's still a game at grassroots level. If there's mass participation, that's the key. The talents are a byproduct of a good grassroots programme because the grassroots is your future fans, referees, administrators, the lot. And you hope that you'll spot in the grassroots one or two that you can put into your elite programmes. Now, it's the elite youth level that's the key thing here. And in places like Spain, Germany, I mean, they've got them in the elite programmes when they're, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. It's only about 11, 12, 13 years old they would go into the clubs, into the professional game. You have to work really hard at it, of course, because you have to work so hard in the academy at getting everything right. Getting the, firstly, getting the scouting right, you know, so that we get the, the best players in at the bottom end. We're going down the age groups far enough to get the young players connected with the club at seven, eight, nine years of age. Now it seems an awful long way away from, from first team football, but it's been proven that if you get them into your system early enough, they'll, they'll generally stay through to the point where they reach the first team. But it's about more than the numbers or the age that the players start at. The only way to compete is to make sure that we're as good as the Germans and the Spanish when it comes to youth development, and then that the players are exposed to the highest level of club competition they can be exposed to. We have to improve the quality of challenge. I, I see some of the Rangers youth teams play, and how they get on, they, they won 8-1 and they won 10-2. There's no challenge. I refer back to the, the next-gen tournament where Man City had, I think they were fantastic, by the way, magnificent approach to youth development. But they had won 8-1 on the Wednesday, or the previous weekend and they played six and lost six in Europe. I think the following year they played six and, one and lost five. But they realised that that's the level they have to get to. The, challenge, the quality of challenge was appropriate. It really did take the players out of the comfort zones and the staff. They learnt from their mistakes 
and then I think three years later in the FA Youth Cup final against Chelsea. So they learnt we have to do the same up here in Scotland. We have to improve the quality of challenge to our best young players. Our elite young players must be offered that type of opportunity and right now I don't see it. And I think the younger ones are, are kind of spoiled now. Everything's put in a plate for them. Uh, we had to graft. Barclay reserve team football at 15 against men. Um, physically, you couldn't handle it. But mentally, you, you, you grew stronger and you grew, grew stronger quicker. If we play underage football now, you go under 15, under 16, under 17, and it's, I think it's under 20 now. Um, and you don't really play against men until you go and play in the first team. Well, you're four or five years behind what we were in terms of mentality. I'm not saying ability-wise. Uh, I'm not talking about ability-wise. I just think it's a mentality. And uh, you either grew up or you, you got shipped out. Simple as that. One club which has recognised that it's about more than just coaching and that it's also about giving young players experience on the pitch is Hamilton. And they have seen their policy pay off with two of the highest achieving players of the current generation, James McCarthy and James MacArthur. I think Hamilton have probably, for me, got the best you set up in Scotland. The reason being is the fact that they're willing to give young players a chance. You know, and they'll play young players, they'll put them into the first team um, at a really early age and, and, and hope that they're, they're good enough to go and compete and, and do well. And, and not only that, but stick by them and stick with them over that sort of period of time. The two Jameses that have moved on in particular, they're certainly the sort of trailblazers for that and they've set the standard for everybody else. I remember we trained at Dale Park and we got a minibus from Hamilton across to Motherwell, trained there, and it could be midwinter, rain and sleet. We were all on the bus waiting to go back home for the shower. Who were we waiting on? James MacArthur, James McCarthy. Still on the pitch, still working, still passing. First to ask an experienced guy a question, what are we doing here, why are we doing this? Young players will surprise you. They'll surprise you in how well they adapt they learn quickly, they problem solve quickly, and they get better quickly. After they came through the youth setup at Hamilton, they both played for Wigan, before McCarthy moved on to Everton and MacArthur to Crystal Palace, the type of move to the English Premier League. Once common for Scottish footballers, there is now a rare occurrence. My belief is if you're good enough, you're old enough. And that means that if there's a 16-year-old good enough, he goes in. Clubs can be a bit more brave in terms of give them a chance, throw them in. What's the worst thing that can happen? In France, Gerard Houlet made a rule. No top division club in France can sign more than 20 players over the age of 21. If you want more players, they've got to be under 21. At Monaco, they get three injured, two suspended. Tagana was the manager, and they were employing this rule. They brought in two 17-year-olds to the first team, Terry Henry and Trezeguet, and two years later, they were in the French national team. Three signalling for Gillespie's free kick. Ralf is up there with him. There's McCoist. No Johnston. Yes, Southampton have scored. In 1990. We beat France to get to the World Cup. In 1994, France didn't qualify to go to America. The reason, I think, is that they had this rule. Every club was forced to promote young players and not bring in old ones and buy foreign ones, the way we've been doing in Scotland. So I went to an SFA meeting. It was called the Football Development Committee. And I said to them, here's a rule, I'm not it's not original. Gerard Hooley introduced it in France. Do that in Scotland. And the representatives from Celtic and Rangers voted against, and the proposal was never instigated. The old firm argued that the youth rule would put them at a disadvantage in Europe. It's a hat trick in this match! There is! A short term approach that has not yielded success as Scottish teams regularly exit Europe in the early qualifying rounds every year. It's unbelievable in Bratislava. It's our media Bratislava 5, Celtic 0. 
By continuing with the same setup, Scottish teams still continue to fail on the international stage. the men's game falters, the women's team is on the rise. I'm happy with the fact that when we do get people at our games and when we do expose people to women's football, they appreciate it for the spectacle and product that it is, which is not the men's game. It's football, but it's football in a different way. And I do think we have a lot to give. I think we've got a tremendous amount to give to football in this country. And I think what we can offer and what we can give, both internationally and domestically, would make this game stronger in Scotland. Society may have changed, but not everyone was keeping up. In September 2013, BBC Scotland presenter and tabloid journalist Tam Cowan wrote a scathing article about the Scotland women's team. I've written newspaper columns for 25 years. I thought it'd been mere sexist that for a quarter of a century I had been taking the piss out of men and male footballers and not once had I had a go at the women. I thought that was very sexist. And then once I try to redress the balance, what happens? My life gets turned upside down. It was horrible at the time, I'll not, I'll not tell you a lie. It was, it was horrible. I remember when I was stood down that day, coming in here at the BBC, and uh, told what action was being taken, and then uh, I, I, I left just before 12 o'clock, before we were due to go in there, with my jacket over my shoulder and the bottom lip trembling. The article provoked a massive outcry and Tam was suspended by the BBC for two weeks from his presenting job on Off the Ball. I think he misjudged the audience, he misjudged the readership, he misjudged the reaction it was going to have because the people that perhaps before would have said, it's just a bit of banter, it's just a bit of this, actually said, well, hang on a second, that's too far, that's not the case. So quite a pivotal moment in terms of changing the way in which people were seeing women's football and letting us know that they were seeing it in a different way as well. Suddenly on the sports fields there were women centre forwards, goalkeepers, right backs, left backs, and better halves. Women had spotted their goals and were now all out to get them. The first official women's game took place in 1881 at Easter Road, Scotland v England. The return leg was played in Glasgow and was abandoned due to a riot by the predominantly male spectators. This led to the game being banned in Scotland. But during the First World War, the women's game blossomed. A Britain where now the women were taking the places of the men. A Britain at last fully gearing herself to modern war. Munitionettes were allowed to and even encouraged to play. Official games were played to raise money for charity. In 1918, Scotland versus England attracted a 7,000 strong crowd at Celtic Park. When the war ended, the women were expected to return to their pre-war lives. Their chance to play was short-lived. The SFA banned women's football from men's clubs. It wasn't until the early 1970s that that ban was effectively lifted. I think that if you look at um women's football, you see a number of quite significant changes that are going on in, in Scottish society more generally. Clearly there's the kind of preeminence of women within Scottish public life, the fact that our First Minister is a woman, the fact that across a whole range of our national bodies, uh, women are now preeminent or prominent within the development of our culture. You could not write the paradox and irony of that in a Scotland that has placed so much emphasis on maleness, on industrial working class, it's uh, lassies that are better. We're now in the fascinating moment where 
the women, in terms of their ability to qualify for European tournaments, are well in advance of the men and may well actually be the next national team to go to a major tournament. The Scottish international team play football at the elite level and includes players like Kim Little, who is one of the best female players in the world. Yet the women's game still receives very little acclaim. But unfortunately, it's not given enough space if there's not a big glamour game ahead. It's got a long way to go in that respect, but that's not the fault of women's football. That's the fault of the media. But you won't get the media exposure unless you've got the people turning up at games, so it's, it's a... It's a difficult one to reconcile. You can have the best quality game ever, you can have the most exciting, most thrilling, some of the best skills, some of the best players. You, I mean, I could have a World Cup winning team playing, but if we don't have any media there, if nobody's seeing it, then, you know, it won't, won't increase. Football is now unashamedly big business. Media rights and an increase in technology over the last decades have given football a global platform and access to a worldwide audience giving them a chance to increase their flow of money. Scotland's inability to stand out or compete in this global context means they remain locked out of the levels of money that would help them compete. It's a cycle. The longer they are excluded, the harder it is to get back in. Whatever people say it's not about money, it is. Whether it's facilities or equipment or tours or whatever it may be, investment is key. Sky are paying £10.2 million pounds per game for English Premier Games. The rights fee they will pay Scottish football is the equivalent of two English Premier Games. Promotion to the Premier League can be worth £100, £200 million pounds to a club. I left Hearts in 1997, and at that time the top salary at the club was around about £1,000 a week. And when I returned in, the, in 2000, we had four players earning £10,000 a week. It wasn't just hearts, it was symptomatic of everything that was going on in, in Scottish football at the time. Dundee United, Aberdeen, Dunfermline, Livingston, they were all Kilmarnock, they were all spending way, way, way beyond uh, their means. There's a direct correlation between finance and success. And you look at, for example, at the top of the pile in, in Scotland just now, Celtic, their current budget would be probably a mid-table championship budget in England. The differences in funding between football in Scotland and England have never been more stark. Financially, we cannot compete no longer with some of the big leagues. So we have to produce the best young players we possibly can. And at this moment in time, it doesn't appear we're doing so. So something needs to change. Is Scotland comparing itself to the wrong country? Would Scotland do better comparing itself to one of a similar size. The club system is at the heart of the whole game, but the current setup dates from a different era. We have 42 clubs in our leagues for a population of five million. By any standard, that's too many. Two Inverness teams, Caledonian and Inverness Thistle, had been trying to gain entry to the Scottish League since the 1970s. In 1994, it was made clear that if the clubs merged, they would stand a much better chance of being admitted. But many feared that this meant the loss of both clubs and their traditions. We knew we could progress if, if given the opportunity. We made the decision at Caledonian FC, where I was playing at the time, to involve the players, because the players wanted to do it. We went along to meetings, got involved in the voting process, which wasn't good. They got really nasty. You know, the authorities, the police were involved at a couple of the meetings. I remember one of the players getting called Judas as he walked in and he was a wee bit late for the meeting. Our own fans at the time at Cali, who were die-hard Caledonian fans in the Highland League, um, were dead against the process. They, their argument was that they felt Caledonian should have gone it alone. 
I'm not interested in the Mernice Thistle. Cali Football Club is the biggest club in the North of Scotland. It's a disgrace we've not been in the Scottish League before, you know? Yes, for us, apply for membership. I'm all merged with Thistle Football Club. It's 55. The no vote is 50. Cali were um, a bigger club at the time, you know, with a bigger support um, and a better sort of infrastructure. Um, so th they felt they should have gone alone. Many younger supporters left the meeting in disgust. One tore up his season ticket. Paid for a vote, they saw me down the river. Hundred years down the tube. Hundred years gone. For what? Well, I'm not going to go and watch Cali again. It was Cali's older members who'd voted for change. Inverness will have a good football team. Maybe I'll not see it, but maybe my, my grandsons and my grandchildren will see it. We did see the football sense in it that there would be a stronger club to go forward and hopefully develop to the leagues. First out the hat came Caledonian Inverness Thistle. Second out of the hat New club was Ross. Inverness Caledonian Thistle did make their way through the leagues. And when they were in the first division, they became famous after a remarkable result in the Scottish Cup against Celtic. Inverness Cali Thistle have made history, the biggest upset in Scottish football for 33 years. Which I still feel to this day is as significant an evening for the club as any other in our history, and that firmly put our name in the football map. The press coverage we got in the aftermath of that game, I think everyone realised then that the potential was there that this club were going places. The gamble paid off. Inverness Caledonian Thistle made the journey from the Highland League to the SPL, and their story didn't end there. Twenty-one years after getting into the Scottish League setup, they won the Scottish Cup. Inverness's success is an argument in favour of mergers, given the right circumstances. Keep your credit and hands off the Merlin Football Club. Mergers don't work for every club. In 1990, the proposed Hearts Hibs merger was always seen more as a takeover, while the Dundee and Dundee United one was called off at the last minute. There are so many factors involved the size of the fan bases, historic relationship between the clubs, location, and the risks versus the potential rewards. It makes total sense for the Angus clubs, for example. You know, I look at the clubs I've played there, I've been to these clubs and, uh, you know, uh, no disrespect, uh, they must find it really difficult to make ends meet and to survive. The Arbros, the Breakins, the Forfers, there's so many clubs in the same area. And they produce good players and always have done. But to progress through the leagues, I mean, I don't think any of these clubs in my time and in the last two decades have been full-time clubs. But you imagine the strength they might have if they did merge. 20 teams could have taken the game forward with common standards, common ideas, and a way to address the fundamental issues that the game faced. I think the fan base of these clubs would grow. You know, you, you would lose some, without a doubt. There would be the diehards that wouldn't be interested, same as we lost some fans in Burnett, disappointingly. But I'm quite sure you'd replace them with new fans. Fans might not want to be involved in every aspect of their clubs, but they definitely want to have their say. In the late 1980s, fans became increasingly frustrated with how the mainstream media was covering the game and not representing their views. Supporters decided to produce an alternative story, and so the Scottish football fanzine was born. Well, the fanzines at the time, things like the absolute game, not the view, the final hurdle at Tannadice, what they did was they democratised football. They gave the, the ordinary football fan a voice Previously, if a football fan wanted to have a say, and you know he could maybe write into the local newspaper or something like that, you know. We loved those fanzines. We loved writing them. We loved reading each other's fanzines because we were seeing the way 
fans really viewed the game and how they talked about it, but most importantly, how they joked about it. It was a chance to sit down and write kind of fairly lengthy articles in a fanzine which addressed a lot of things that mainstream media perhaps were not addressing. So it kind of it was the first starting of breaking that that, that kind of almost sacred mould between the mainstream media guys, the journalists and, and the clubs. You know, um, th there was a crack in the door there and the fanzine movement pushed that door ajar. Obviously, you, you require a lot of self-deprecatory humour if you're a supporter of an unsuccessful team and a frequently unsuccessful country uh, in football terms. It broke down the barriers between clubs and fans. It was no longer the case of turn up, pay your money and shut up. Um, we'll tell you it's good for you. You know, you finally had the fans actually saying, well, you know what, we've got to say. I mean, the final hurdle regularly outsold the official programme. Football coverage was always really pole-faced. If something uh, untoward happened, you know, we we'll always talk about bringing the game into disrepute or if, whether it's a, if there's some big bust up, we've got to talk about it in the most sombre terms in the media, as if it was some national disgrace, whereas the fans love it and they love making jokes about it. You're tuned to Off The Ball, the most petty and ill-informed sports programme on radio. Another product of the fanzine movement was BBC Radio Scotland's Off The Ball, an iconic programme dealing with football, politics, and popular culture. Refs versus the fans. A periscope, how I saw the game. And what does Dundee United mean to you? I'm Stuart Cosgrove, he's Tam Cowan. And you're Our slogan is the most petty and ill-informed sports programme on radio. And we did that almost as a kind of antidote to something that you see all the time in the media, which is journalists claiming that they're informed. How many times have you heard people turn around and say, my sources tell me that, uh, don't worry, he'll be the manager by tomorrow, I can assure you, I have close sources at the club. And they try to convey to the reader that they are more informed than anyway. We wanted to go in a different distance and say, we don't know anything, we are ill-informed, we actually get everything wrong, we're football fans, therefore we are hypocrites. We see wrong in every other club in Scotland and only our club's right, so football fans are hypocrites. The show reflects that hypocrisy. We've always tried to um, have the spirit of the show is such that it, it, it would hopefully sound like guys in the pub talking yeah. about the football. He held his phone up yeah. behind the goals yeah. to film it in his phone, and this wasn't some old crackly image, it didn't look no, awful. No, it was a very decent image. And 25,000 yeah. Rangers fans tuned in here. The innovation this time was not that it was being recorded, it was being live streamed. No, the guy yeah. said that his arm was ag I mean, what yeah. an effort. I, I've noticed in the, the last few years, I mean, certainly in the period of time that we've been doing off the ball, that supporting some of the smaller teams has been almost a kind of counterculture in Scottish football. We get tremendous uh, support um, from uh, the, the fans of kind of the other teams, as it were. Uh, and often when the, the show is at its most popular is when it's having digs at the kind of hypocrisies and kind of delusions of the bigger teams. I, I like the Periscope innovation and it allows people who are not at the game to see it, but I'm still a great believer that if you're a football fan and you can reach the game and you've got the money and you can get there, go to the game, it's ah, always, always better. The arrival of social media gave fans even more ways to have their voices heard, changing forever the way the game is reported, consumed and shared. One of the biggest differences between the fanzine movement was, you know, it took a bit of time to sit down, type the fanzine out, get it off to the printers and all the rest of it, then it would hit the streets maybe a week after it was printed, that kind of stuff. I mean, nowadays, and even in the message board days, everything was then instantaneous, you know. The media is no longer the inverted commas inside track which it once would claim to be. So if I wanted to know what was happening, I needed to, to read a particular journalist or get, you know, hear a particular uh, broadcaster who I know had good access. Those days, are, those days don't exist, those days are gone now. So the media has become more complicated and more layered. Everything is solid media, you know? Whereas before you used to have to wait for your morning paper to find out what happened. Um, now, all of the information is there, almost sometimes before the players have left the field. It's kind of like supping with the devil to it, isn't it? You need a long spoon. Um, it's, it, you know, it, it is at once the haunt of the madman uh, and the highly articulate. 
and sometimes they both converge. Somebody described, for example, social media, Twitter to me is, is a bit like entering a pub at times when everybody's on their ninth pint, you know, <laughs> and everybody's got an opinion. Uh, and so we have this kind of age of a rush to judgement. It's a way that football supporters interact with clubs, they interact with players, they interact with management, um, and it kind of roots us closer to them as well. So I'm a, I'm a strong advocate of it. If it's used correctly and it's used in a productive way, I think it's a good thing. You could put boards of directors and football clubs under much more pressure with arguments than even you could in the fanzine days, you know, so the, 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 there was great change going on and there was a radical element. I mean, we've seen it with Foundation of Hearts, um, we, we've seen it with some of the Rangers fans groups uh, and you see it, you know, at clubs, usually when clubs are in trouble. Social media allows fans to have their say, but fans still often feel that their voices are either drowned out or ignored by clubs and the authorities. There is no question that people feel that there is a disconnect between the structures and the ownership structures of football and the fans that go to games. If you looked at a club like Celtic, Celtic are managed as a PLC. They are under a legal requirement to make announcements to the City of London before they even tell their own fans what it is they're doing. So there clearly is there a commercial disconnect. Hearts, Hibs, St Mirren and Motherwell are all attempting to address this by exploring different models of fan ownership. I think we have to get a real understanding of what we mean by supporters' ownership for the people who are advocating. So I don't think it's going to be easy. I certainly don't think there is one right answer for all clubs. Personally, I don't think we should have wall-to-wall -wall supporter groups all wanting a say in running the football club. I think it has to be channeled. The individual supporters have got to identify who do they trust to look after their interests, and they're the people that have to work with the club. There's a bit of education got to go on about exactly what do we mean by supporters' ownership. At this moment in time, we're going towards the position where supporters can take a majority ownership of the shares of the football club. We're actively and have actively been promoting that. These are additional elements that football supporters are doing above and beyond the norm, above and beyond season tickets. And they're doing it because they want to, they don't want to stand outside and demonstrate. I think it's a win-win situation for us as a club and for them as supporters. These experiments are still at an early stage in Scotland, but there are successful examples in Europe. In the German Bundesliga, Members and fans must own at least 51% of the shares in their clubs. It's a model that seems to work. Bundesliga teams have won three Champions League titles in the last 10 years, and the German international team won the World Cup in 2014. Working it in, chance for Goetze! Manuel Goetze has scored for Germany! The fans are essential to the game. But the fans themselves have changed. Once almost uniformly male and flat capped, the terrace has offered one of the few forms of escapism from hard industrial labour. The clubs now have to find new ways to entice fans into their grounds, especially considering the high ticket prices. In an age of on demand entertainment and endless competition for our disposable income, fans want more than just a game when they walk through the gates. In the late 19th, early 20th century, there were very few alternatives to recreation. Uh, now there are, and recreation is no longer the monopoly of one sex as it was for those people who went to football matches in the, in the 1890s and uh, down to the period after the, the Second World War. So there's huge competition for people. Don't forget, we're talking about a society where eating out was rare as recently as the 1970s. The game could work much harder to broaden its appeal, opening it up to a wider audience. I think it's massively important to a football club that you encourage families because they are your lifeline. Without fans, we don't have a football club. It's as simple as that. You've got to encourage them to come in. You've got to encourage uh, the mums and the dads to bring the kids because they're our fans of the future. However, it all comes down to money and that's the problem. Uh, and there's just not enough money in the game anymore in Scotland. Uh, I personally feel it's, it's on the decline at the moment. Clubs are watching their pennies, have to be very careful about how they spend their money. 
a lot of the things that we, you know, f clubs could be doing for the fans' experience does cost money. I personally think that a lot more could be done to improve fans' experience. You only have to go over to the States to see how amazing the fans' experience is. Fans come for the excitement of live football. What they often experience, though, are crowds. But here, technology helps fans handle those hassles at one of the most wired arenas in the U.S. Getting into the game is easier. Food can be ordered online. Wi-Fi hotspots keep everyone connected and give information on the quickest way to seats or to exit the stadium. These initiatives make the club money and the fan experience more enjoyable. That particular expression of, oh, but this is football, it's different, or, oh, but that's how it's done in football, it's used too often without thinking. It's, it's used too often without saying, well, hang on a minute, maybe that's the way it's normally done in football, or maybe that's the way it's always been done here. But can we just stand back a wee minute and say, is it right, you know? And again, just to me, it just comes back to this questioning, you know, let's not just drift along doing things the same old, same old way. But say, I don't know, th the world is moving on. So many things are changing around about us. Um, how on earth are we going to actually cope with some of these changes? And by the way, could we use some of these changes to make our, our jobs either easier or improve things or whatever? Anne Bunch, Chief Executive of Heart of Midlothian Football Club, has a reputation for asking the right questions. She's brought integrity back to hearts. I think she's brought a real sense of ownership. She's a strong leader, she's a strong woman. She'll buck conventions just because it's always happened doesn't mean it has to happen that way again. Let, let's look at something different. You need people like Anne Budge on the committees asking the questions to, can we change it, why not? New perspectives and voices are emerging in some places. Perhaps evidence that the old system is beginning to adapt to the 21st century. Thirty years ago, a female coach of a team playing in the Scottish lower leagues would have been unthinkable. Win the battles, first and second balls, that'll be important for us, OK? Shots in 2013, Shelley Kerr was appointed the first female coach of Lowland League side Stirling University. It was the following day I was in to meet the players at half past seven in the morning and then by five o'clock that evening it was just it was incredible the you know tv radio um, newspapers it was just it was just crazy it was a distraction i have to say and and i tried to as best as possible keep that distraction away from the players because all i wanted to do was try and get off to a good start Divide. That little bit of balance on the edge of the box for anything coming back out, OK? I have to say the players were magnificent in terms of their reaction. Get it out. Good timing. There was an instant respect um, of my knowledge of football. Keep the tempo high when you're playing the ball. It wasn't a problem at all. They were great. Now we go, Ellie! Ellie! Come on. Unfortunately, I'm the only female right now that's working in the men's game, um, especially in Scotland. We need more females, but only if they're interested in doing that. I've got ambitions to work in within a professional environment. If you're asking me, will it happen? I think we're a wee bit um, away from that happening, that appointment happening right now. You're competing with so many good coaches. Um, so it's not just a gender issue here, it's about the competition that you're facing. I think I'm qualified, I think I've got the attributes. Um, I think it would be still deemed as being a risk by some um, club owners, um, chief executives at clubs. And that's down to probably the pressure from supporters. I've got the skill set, but I still think it would be maybe seen as a risk. Well done. Stuart, all the best. The best. Done. It is, if not the, but one of the biggest games in this country. It's something that runs throughout most families. It's, it's in our DNA, it's in our culture, it's in our blood. And it's something that is not in a great place in this moment. It's sad to see that. I want to see football, men's, women's, boys, girls, whatever. I want to see football doing well. 
So to be part of the women's, you know, renaissance, if you want, this this growth is, is fantastic. But if, if we can do it together with the guys, I think that would be fantastic for Scotland. The future of football in global terms is not in doubt. Big money, huge media profile, ever-increasing transfer fees and wages, relentless media coverage and worldwide fame and recognition for the big stars of the game. However, in Scotland, a country which not so long ago competed on level terms with many of the countries now boasting the big glamour leagues, the future is a lot less certain. You look at our team's performances in Europe, our, the Celtics of this world, our teams are going out at the qualifying stages. And when these teams go out, we have a post-mortem of a, a month where we talk about we're, we're playing, we're not starting the league early enough, we have to bring the start date forward so our players are ready. Nonsense. It's nothing to do with that. It's that we're not producing good enough players and our league's not good enough. And until we actually face up to that, and actually start doing something about it, we're going to continue to have that same conversation every August, September of every year. In a country of five million people, is our current system really working? Countries of similar size, like Ireland, Denmark and Norway, have relatively low profile leagues, but do produce players that play in the big ones. Jockstein said 50 years ago that football is nothing without the fans, but with crowds in decline at many clubs, is the current structure the best that it could be? Something that's so important to such a big part of the population has got to be taken seriously and taken notice of. A fairer distribution of the money that's in football could be good for the game overall. Not just a matter of, oh, well, I, I want to get a wee bit more, or you should get a wee bit less. That's not the point to me. It's a right distribution to enable the growth of the game and to enable more clubs to compete and actually, in some cases, survive. There is nothing better than a sold-out sign to make people want to come in. Let's get the game right here. Let's get people in through the gates and let's generate an atmosphere and get some good football played. And the rest will take care of itself. The way forward may be painful, but it can also be enjoyable, reshaping and reforming the game in a way that suits our country, our ambitions and our aspirations. Some things we're scared to change. We think, what's the point? Why change? Um, whereas it should be the exact opposite. We need to change. We need to do things differently. But people don't like change in general. It takes them outside their comfort zone. People don't like being outside their comfort zone generally. It's time to step back and reflect on the last 30 years. Will Scottish football hit the tipping point and have no other choice but to embrace radical change? How long will clubs be driven by self-interest at the expense of the overall good of the game? The future of our football is up for grabs. Maybe, just maybe in the years ahead, it will once again be a successful, compelling spectacle that all of Scotland can be proud of.